Welcome to the Lake Michigan Kayak Fishing Podcast. Fish on, fish on, fish on. There we go. There we go. Exclusively on YouTube.com slash Shot City Yacker. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode three of the Lake Michigan Kayak Fishing Podcast. My name is Michael, also known as Shot City Yacker. Welcome to uh, my channel and to the podcast. If it's your first time here, you can check out the playlist on my channel, YouTube.com slash Shot City Yacker. For the uh, Lake Michigan Kayak Fishing Podcast, you can ch uh, check out all the episodes. Uh, there's 11 episodes in total planned for this first season. Uh, we're doing these seasonally and episodically. And uh, yeah, so just trying to get you caught up a little bit on the podcast itself. And uh, the focus is to get everyone geared up for this next season, Kayak Fishing Lake Michigan. So whether you are already experienced, you know, I think this first season is going to be a lot of refresher for, for a lot of different subject matters here. And f more importantly, for all the people that are new and want to get into kayak fishing uh, Lake Michigan, I think and I hope I should say that this is going to be a great resource for you to uh, get yourself ready, right? Um, we've talked about some of the initial kind of um, in episode one, kind of like the basics. We got to kind of cover the basics, which we did. Um, episode two, uh, we discussed, uh, what did we discuss? Actually, I kind of forgot what my, where are my notes at? I should probably have my notes here. Sorry about that. There we go. Uh, episode two was all about the kayaks, ultimate kayak uh, guide for Lake Michigan. I shared uh, basically uh, encompassing all of the different kayaks available out there and what I believe to be the best ones, um, not specific kayaks, but just in terms of like, you know, the, the, the types that you should be looking for if you want to get out in the big water. Um, so we covered that in episode two and here in episode three, it's all about the gear. Oh yes. It's the, uh, it, you know, the interesting, interesting thing about gear, if you guys haven't already figured this out is, I think it catches us sometimes more than the uh, lures and tackle catch the fish, which is what they're intended to do. But man, when these companies market to us, they just, whew, you know, and then you got to get out there and buy all the hot new lures and all of this and all of that, the new rod, the new reel, it can add up. But unlike bass fishing, I really believe that in terms of um, gear for uh, kayak fishing, uh, salmon and trout on Lake Michigan, it's not as expensive uh, overall, I would say, because, you know, compared to bass fishing or some other species inland fishing where you need different rods and different lures, depending on the time of day and what season it is, you know, generally when you're uh, salmon and trout fishing out like Michigan, it's really just a handful of lures that work year round. I mean, it really is. You could literally just have like three or four different types of lures and two rods and just run that the entire year and you're going to catch fish throughout the year. So with that being said, you know, it, it's really kind of cost effective in that regard. And so for this ultimate gear guide that I have planned for you in this episode, which uh, I wrote it all out, it, it looks long on paper. I'm going to do my best to not make it extremely long. I'm going to try and, you know, really stick to the meat and potatoes of what I believe are essential, you know, gear you're going to need. Uh, I'm going to break this down into four sections. Uh, we're going to start off with the rod section. We'll move on. We'll move on into the reel section for number two. Uh, third section will be uh, line. Uh, fourth section will be tackle. And we'll do a bonus here just to kind of cover anything else. And I do have a few things that didn't fall into any one of those first four categories. So we'll do like a miscellaneous slash accessories thing. So maybe, I guess maybe five sections in total. Uh, so with that being said, let's jump straight into section one here. As we talk about rods, um, when you're out on Lake Michigan kayak fishing, you're really mostly trolling. Yes, you can at certain times of the year cast for these fish. Absolutely, 100%. And in, in, in those instances, you can really just use a crankbait rod that you would use for bass fishing. 100%. You know, and, and most times when I do, I'm using a medium action uh, you know, parabolic bending, you know, uh, uh, casting rod with 12 to 15 pound floral line, and you can cast that way. But as, in terms of trolling, uh, which happens more times throughout the year or most of the time throughout the year on Lake Michigan uh, for salmon and trout, uh, you really have kind of two options in this uh, area for rods. Now, you have the typical downrigger rods, and then you have non downrigger rods. Uh, for me, when I think of downrigger rods, I'm thinking of the big, you know, kind of like a little thicker and bulkier, um, 
uh, downrigger rods will have a lot of foam padding on 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 the handle on, on the front portion where above the reel and then on the back side um and, and and to me those always feel kind of bulky and then you have non downrigger rods but they're still made for trolling uh i don't know if you've ever seen those before but they do make them uh these kinds of rods are a little bit slimmer they don't have nearly as much foam and and, and some of that uh you know cork stuff all over the place which i'm not really too much of a fan of uh i personally uh like the non downrigger style rods simply because they're less bulky and and a lot of times they almost are similar to what you would use for a you know casting rod but uh they're just a little bit bigger and longer now these things can be fairly inexpensive uh some of my fir my first two rods ever that i used were only like 20 bucks the current rods that i use and i'll share with you here specifically what they are and uh, that's just what I use. There's there's plenty out there that you can choose from to fit your budget, fit your style, fit your, you know, what you like. Uh, but the current ones I have are in the $40 range, I want to say. And uh, I, I, I really like the ones I have now simply because it doesn't have the big foam foregrip and and uh, just the, the, the foam on front, in front of the reel section, right? For me, this is important because when you put your rod into the rod holder, you don't want that foam uh, portion of the of the rod to interfere with your ability to to cleanly put your rod in, and more importantly, pull your rod out of the rod holder when you do hook up into a fish. That's the worst feeling in the world when you're trying to fight the rod holder because it just you know it's holding onto the foam, and the foam is so thick, and you're trying to fight the the weight of the fish, and you're trying to get the the front of the rod that has the foam section through the rod holder to pull it all the way out. I had bad experiences with those. And so for me, I absolutely do not want, you know, the, the big padded foam on, on the, that section of, a, of the rod um, in which the ones that I do have now do not have that. Um, it's pretty much just the, uh, the the blank itself and just a little bit of a cork at the front. Um, it's not too much. And I can easily slide my rod in and out of the holder when a fish is on. And uh, that goes a little way. That's like one of those little details things that, that I don't think people really think of until they're actually, you know, on the water and it happens. They're like, oh my God, I'm fighting with my rod holder to, uh, you know, get my rod out of it because the big foam is is not sliding through that space um, smoothly. It becomes an issue. So that's something that I would offer to uh, bear in mind when you are choosing a rod, um, you know, how's it going to fit in? Uh, and this is very dependent on the rod holder that you do have some rod holders. If you, if you're using like the bazooka tube uh, types where you're just sticking in the, you know, back section, the butt section of the rod into it. Um, this might not even apply to you. Um, the rod holders that I do have, which are the uh, Yak Attack Omega Pros. Uh, it's not like that. You have to kind of slide the rod in and it is, it holds into the seat with the reel. Um, that is something that I do have to think about. So uh, keep this, you know, keep that in mind depending on what kind of rod holder you have, this will kind of may or may not impact you. But um, in terms of looking at, you know, what kind of specs on your rod, uh, generally I like rods that are longer, eight foot, uh, eight something, no more than nine foot would be the cap on a trolling rod. The reason why I like that length is because when you're, when you're trolling out here with the additional length, it'll help to just keep those lines out further away from your kayak it's it's almost like a little hack way to get a little bit of a spread um with your lines right so when you set your lines out to the left and to the right of you if you have an eight foot plus uh rod it means that that line is going to stick out you know off to the, each side of your kayak at, at a at a little bit longer distance than um using a six or seven footer right it, it's it's obviously not a, it's a whole lot but i think it's enough to you know make a difference there and uh, also, I prefer telescopic uh, rods as well. Something that you could break down. Um, the reason for this is it just makes it easier for transportation purposes. You know, you don't have like this long eight foot plus rod and, you know, trying to figure out where, where to put it. If you can't store it in the kayak itself, you got to put it in your car. And for me, it's just one of those little kind of uh, convenience things. So uh, the ones that I do have now are telescopic. So I just shoot it down and it breaks down into like six foot something and, it just makes my life easier. This is obviously a preference thing. You don't obviously have to do this, but that's just currently 
uh, the the rods that I have, which are actually the Berkeley Heritage Trolling Rod. I don't even know that these uh, that they're available anymore. I don't know if they discontinued it or if it's sold out. I happened to look online before, as I was doing my you know research and putting together the podcast, and you really can't find it. I found it on one place online, and it's selling for like forty five dollars, uh, which is right around the price that it costed me. I want to say. But uh, I, I really like it. In fact, I'm kind of sad. I'm, I don't know if I'm being, <laughs> maybe I'll buy another one just to kind of have, or another two just to have in, as backups because I really, really do like them. They're 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 light. Um, the blank isn't big and thick, but it is strong. I've I've caught kings on twenty plus twenty five pound plus king, so it it works great. Um, so I do like it because it's a lighter blank. It's a lighter rod overall. You know, when you're on a kayak, I'm always cognizant of weight and gear because i, I want to try and uh, have the least amount of weight as possible it just makes everything more efficient and easier to handle uh versus a big clunky rod that weighs a lot and you're trying to fight the fish and do all these kinds of things um those are just again another bit of a, a tip and and something to be mindful of when you're putting your gear together here um so with rods honestly just to kind of cap off the, this section here, it's probably the, one of the easiest parts of the gear uh, that you can, you know, do really. I mean, they're not really expensive. Um, I think there's a couple places you can look online for, for trolling rods. I find that fishusa.com um, is generally pretty good, uh, I think, because they focus on, I think they're based in uh, over by Lake Erie somewhere. And so they kind of have a lot of gear that apply to us on, on the Greater Lakes as a whole. Um, that you can find some stuff. Uh, you got Lake Michigan Angler. Shout out to Rob. Uh, they have uh, inventory and gear there as well that you can check out. Um, so there's there's definitely outlets where you can look at. But the rods generally, you know, I I don't see a reason why you have to go hundred dollars plus for a trolling rod. I, I feel I feel like the thirty to sixty dollar range is is perfect to get you a rod that's going to do the job that you need it to do, which is just one thing. It's just to sit in the rod holder. Um, be able to troll and you want it to be able to, to, to load up on the weight so that when a fish does hit, it has enough bend that will give. You don't obviously want a stiff enough rod that will, you know, when these fish strike, they strike hard. You don't want it to just, I don't know, have a stiff rod and it takes it and it bends and it pops or something crazy like that. You want to have a medium action rod that will, will bend and will take on that weight pretty good, but still stiff enough that it will set the hook in once the you know, fish uh, takes the uh, takes the bait and swims off with it. It'll set it in uh, to the mouth of the fish. Um, medium are really good for this, so that would be my suggestion. Now, let's move into section two here with the reels. These are more important, uh, obviously, because this is the workhorse of your uh, setup, right? This is what's going to um, provide the drag, and it's going to be what you're going to use to crank down and, and reel in that fish. There's two styles of reels that apply here. You have your line counter reels and, of course, your non-line counter reels. When we're talking about kayak fishing Lake Michigan here, it's it's very simple in the sense of what you need to, to get out there and catch fish, right? When we're talking about lures, and we'll get to that a little later on, uh, when you talk about these setups, rod and reel and line, it's, it's very simple compared to other um, styles of fishing, in my opinion, uh, where you might need more stuff and more diverse things to fit different conditions and, and scenarios. Um, when, when you have, but, but the real challenge in salmon and trout fishing and, and doing it out of your kayak is being able to replicate, um, you know, the conditions under which the fish, you know, hit. And by that, I mean, were you trolling? How far deep was your bait? Was your presentation? Um, did they bite it at 20 feet? Did they bite it at 10 feet? Was it at 30 plus feet? And typically when you get a bite at a certain depth in you know certain water temperature, that tends to put a pattern together. And when you're fishing on this big, vast open body of water, you need to be able to dial that in to replicate what caught one fish and do it over and over again. And the vast majority of times, this will lead to multiple catches. Usually when you find one fish in one area, um, you know, if it was 10 feet down and it was off to your side or whatever, and you were using XYZ lure, if you are able to replicate that same condition and present that lure and that setup in the same way that you caught that prior fish, it's very likely that you will hook up again. And with that being said, line counters are absolutely, in my opinion, uh, 
needed in order to do this. It's instrumental in allowing you to replicate what you did again and again and again to catch fish. Uh, when you let out your line, if you let out 50 feet of line um, and you catch a fish, when you go and to set your line back out, you're going to put it back out and use the line counter to put it back out at 50, put it in your rod holder and wait for that next bite. Odds are you're going to get bit again. Uh, when you have no line counter, it's not impossible. Guys do it all the time. They'll go out there and they'll troll with the um, spinning gear set up, which is per perfectly fine. You know, you can do that um, in certain portions of the year. It's, it's more of uh, it, it, you can get away with it more than than other times. Uh, the only thing with that is is you're just kind of guesstimating your your you know the amount of line that you have out there, and it's not as accurate and it's not as precise. Um, and being able to replicate that time and time again. I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm not saying that guys don't do it and are successful. Absolutely, 100%. But I think just having a line counter on your reel just gives you the, the it just hones in and allows you to replicate things way more effectively time and time again. And you'll get caught up on fish um pretty, pretty good amount of times. Now, when we're talking about reel sizes, um, there's a couple different sizes that you can go with here. For me, I really think that if you go with like a 15 or 20 size reel, um, if you're using, you know, regular lines here, and by regular lines, I mean mono, floral, braid, I think that is more than enough. And you you might be hearing like a 15 size reel or a 20 size reel in, in the line counters. You're They're not really big. And, you know, you might be thinking, well, that's not a lot of line on there. Well, you, you generally don't need a lot of line. Uh, Keep in mind here, folks, that you're not fishing from a big boat, a charter boat, where when you hook up, the boat's still running lines. It's not really going to stop, and you're essentially fighting the fish while dragging it through the water. For me, you know, I don't find enjoyment out of that. Ever since I got into kayak fishing for salmon, it's a totally different experience. You can't can't compare it whatsoever. Can't compare it. Um, the reason why you don't need a bigger size reel if you're using floral mono or even braid is because... Uh, when you do hook up into the fish, you have two kind of like benefits um, that allow you to do this, to get away with a smaller uh, reel and line capacity on it is that one, when you do hook up, uh, if it's a big fish, it's going to take you for a sleigh ride, as we call it. You're going to get dragged around. Remember, you're also an additional kind of resist resistance and tr or drag on the water when these fish, you know, pull you around. Um, and because of that you can never really run out of line you really cannot run out of line all you have to do is just turn towards the fish paddle pedal or motor your way towards it to, to pick up the line and you're good to go you just tire it out um so you don't need you know 500 yards of line or just some kind of crazy amount of line you don't really need a lot of line um because you're able to move with the fish and uh stay on top of it and you're good to go now when we're talking about um lead core or copper, I would definitely recommend going up to a 30 size lead core. I'm sorry, 30 size uh, reel because you're going to need that that additional, um, uh, you know, uh, capacity because lead core and copper are thicker, much more thicker than regular line. So you're going to need that 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 extra capacity. I would say uh, a 30 size is what I have on my lead or the re size reel that I have for my lead core. And it works just fine. Now, it is much more bulkier. It is a lot more to handle. Um, that's also why I recommend going with a 15 to 20 size reel for, for your regular lines because it's easy to palm it with one hand, hold it in one hand, and let's say you're going to go net or you need to grab something else while you're fighting the fish. Um, it's easier just to control it in the palm of your hand. I can palm it, hold it, and thumb it. It's a lot easier. When you get into the 30 size, it's, it's a lot bulkier. Maybe you have a lot bigger hands. This might not apply to you. So I guess this could be, you know, dependent on your hand size. Um, but I do find with like the 30 size, when I do have a, a, a hookup on my lead core, the 30 size, it's a lot more to kind of hold on to and manage because um, the reel is a lot bigger. It's also going to be important that on these reels, whatever you pick, you're going you're gonna to want to have a good drag system on it. Uh, obviously, when you hook up into some of these bigger fish, uh, when they take off, they take off. They're going to pull pretty fast. Um, and a lot of times they're going to be pulling very sporadically just when you think you've got them and, and, and they're pretty chilled out and you're easing them back into the boat and you can see them at the surface now and they're getting really close and you got the net out and you're thinking, hey, we got this one. And that all of a sudden just turns, away, uh, turns on and it just jets off on you. Um, those are prime times where a lot of guys will lose fish because 
Uh, one, they weren't expecting it, but two, more importantly, their drag, that, that sudden burst uh, of the fish taking off and that drag is not set properly. And if it's not a smooth drag, that'll, that'll just, you know, give away line smoothly. Um, it'll break off something in the line or something will break away and you'll lose that fish. So having a, a reel with a, you know, good drag system is very important here. Uh, gear ratio doesn't matter too much uh, because remember, you're not reeling in baits with this thing. You're simply just fighting the fish. So a lot of these reels that are, uh, you know, tr trolling reels, line counter reels, you're getting gear ratios in like the four something, so maybe 5.1 tops. Um, that's generally what you're going to get. So don't expect to be, you know, a uh, 7.1 bass fishing, you know, burning them in. Uh, you really don't want to do that anyway. You just want to kind of, you know, grind them out and just kind of um, um, horse them in and do it, you know, with a, with a sturdy, um, slower uh, ratio. So that you're not trying to overdo them when you're bringing them in here. Me personally, because I get asked this uh, quite a bit uh, in terms of what, uh, reel do i use um all my reels are okuma magda pro series um and i have no affiliation with okuma i use their products it just works really well the line counters have not failed me they've been rock solid uh year over year i started off with their magna pro a uh, magda pro on version one and the current ones i have which are i guess the version two which are a lot nicer. They're more rounded edges. It's a it's a more modern look versus the um, uh, version one uh, Magda Pros, which are a little bit more like squared and, and just kind of uh, harder edges. Uh, the new ones that I'm currently using or the newer ones, I should say, um, are a lot more smoother, look more sleek, just more eye appealing, but they perform all just the same. And, and I, I really enjoy them. This will be my fourth season using them. Uh, but again, there's there's other options out there. Uh, so look out, you know, look to see what's out there. Look at your price points, um, you know, read the reviews. And I think when you're looking at a real counter, uh, a line counter reel, you're going to want to look at the comments specifically for um, remarks or comments about the line counter. You don't want to see stuff where people saying that it's failed, it's locked up or it stopped counting. Um, that's a red flag that you might might not want to pick the reel that you're looking at. Look for other ones that uh, you'll see positive comments about it, you know, being durable and sturdy and the line counter not going out, and out on you. Typically on these line counter reels, the line counter is one of the first things to kind of go go off or, you know, go bad on you. So just something to be mindful of, right? Section, uh, are we at section three already? Wow, okay, cool. I thought uh, this would be taking a little bit longer than what it is. Uh, let's talk about line. Everything has to do with line here. Um, you have... A couple different options for your line here. Obviously, there's mono, you have fluoro, you have braid, lead core, and even copper. I'll tell you right now, I don't use copper. Copper is something that I don't even think I will. And it's also, um, for me, a little bit complicated. Uh, a lot of guys will run this on the boats. However, I do know of some guys in the kayak that will run a copper line. And uh, kudos to them. I don't think it's really necessary. I think lead core is 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 more than enough if you're out of a kayak to do. Um, you know, keep in mind when you're doing lead core, it's 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 heavier, it requires a bigger reel, um, and uh, lead core itself can be a little fickle to to deal with. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. Um, this all can be situational. Which line you're going to use for what conditions here, right? For example, if you're flatline trolling cr uh, crankbaits. Yes, you could use mono. Uh, however, I think the better pick here is to go with f straight fluoro or even braid. Um, fluoro simply because it, you know it weighs and it it'll sink in the water. Um, and when you're trolling, you obviously want to get your bait down as deep as possible. So I would recommend fluoro or a braid to fluoro leader um, for that situation. If you're trolling, say spoons or flies. Um, you could use uh, mono floor or braid because you're going to end up tying off a weight onto your line to get that down, whether it's a downrigger, whether it's a torpedo weight. We'll talk about that later on in the uh, podcast um, because you're going to use a weight to get that down. Um, you could just go with straight mono because you're not really worried about the line having to go down in the water. Mono tends to float. 
Uh, but because you're tying a weight onto the line, in this case, it doesn't matter. So these can be kind of situational uh, picks on which line to use, depending on what you're going to do. Obviously, mono is the cheapest, pretty readily available. Um, it gets the job done for sure. It definitely gets the job done. Fluoro isn't as cheap as mono, uh, but you do have that invisible factor in the water with fluoro. It's also generally a smaller diameter for, for the um, same amount of pound test, which is something that I like. Um, so you can factor that in into possibly getting a strike if, say, the fish are just kind of being weird or maybe very fickle or um, I don't know if they really get line shy. I can't honestly say if I've ever experienced anything like that, but I tend to just use only floral or braid anyway, so I don't have a lot of experience with mono, but I don't I don't generally think it's, it's too much of an issue in terms of that. Um, braid is my personal favorite to use, though. Um, I use 30 pound high vis um, braid. I use that as my main line and on my reels, I'll put a backing of 20 pound mono as, as a backing on the reel, maybe about 50 to hundred feet of it. Then I'll tie off the high vis line, you know, braided 20, uh, 30 pound line. And I'm running just the braid, um, on there, which then gets, uh, tied off to a barrel swivel. And then I'll run either my leader or if I am running a Dodge, uh, Dodger or a flasher, I'll put the flasher there. And then the flasher and the Dodger will have the floral, um, leader to the, you know, the presentation, the lure if it's the fly or if it's a spoon or whatever the case may be. The key here though, I want to mention is that I'm always using high quality, small size ball bearing swivels to connect that main line to the leader. And I'm not using any knots. I'm not using the FG knot for this, which is my favorite uh, knot to tie to connect uh, two lines together. Um, I have uh, less failure rate doing this. Um, plus using that swivel and having a, a bigger diameter bead on there also come, comes into play when you're tying off your torpedo weights or any other kind of a planer board on there so that it, if it doesn't slide down on your line, um, you don't want that coming in contact with the fish. So it acts like a uh, stop measure to prevent um, more specifically the weights from sliding down when you're using torpedo weights. Again, this will all come together towards the end when we get to that section when we talk about weights. And uh, I might need to actually do a video on the torpedo. I don't believe I've done one on my channel to explain how it works and give it like an actual visual demonstration. So if you think that'll be useful, let me know in the comments below and I can uh, work on something. Uh, I can actually work on that before the season even gets started to uh, demonstrate that. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, for me, I'm using just, you know, 50 pound rated uh, small high quality ball bearing swivels to connect my main line to whatever else is going to go on to the end of the main line, whether it's a leader, whether it's a flasher, a dodger, or whatever the case. And then from there afterwards is where I'll use the floral um, leader. All right, cool. I think we covered everything we needed to cover with line. All right. You have options there. Uh, you can pick whatever, you, you know, best suits you under the right kind of conditions or the right, uh, I guess, presentation you're going to make. Take that into consideration. Now let's move into tackle. Whew, there's a lot to talk about in this section here. Tackle. This is the fun stuff, isn't it? This is where we can get into this rabbit hole because there's just so much out there that works um, or, you know, potentially can work that you're interested in trying and getting. Uh, plus, you know, the marketing on a lot of these things <laughs> catches us more than the fish, as I said before. Um, however, in my years of fishing Lake Michigan, I found that there's really a handful of cranks that just work year over year, time over time. Uh, you know, season over season. Um, and I've even found a new crankbait. Oh man. I don't even know if I want to mention, I can make it real quiet. I don't know if I want to mention this just yet. Oh, but I found a new crankbait that absolutely killed the Kings this past fall. I'm talking about at least 60% of my catches that are on my channel. You guys seen the videos up here. If not, take a look at least 60% of them were caught on this, this, this uh, relatively new lure. I'll, I'll share that in a little bit, just because, you know, you guys are here on the podcast with me and I appreciate it. Um, so let's get started with uh, crankbaits. Um, I'm going to break this down into a couple sections within like the greater crankbait uh, <laughs> conversation here. Uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to break it down into like the, the styles and the brand, and then I'm going to uh, break it down into colors. So, so again, we're going to talk about actual, Brands and by brands, really, I mean like the styles. There's different styles of crankbait that that really just work on Lake Michigan here. Um, and then I'll speak to uh, speak on the colors, which can be very um, 
you know, overwhelming for a lot of people because there's just, just so many to choose from on, on these, um, from these manufacturers. Um, so first crankbait brands, uh, the ones that for me are go to that I would absolutely tell anyone you have to have at least these sure you can have other ones. Absolutely. Sure. Go right ahead. But <laughs> if you don't have these three in there, you're doing yourself at the surface. Um, Berkeley flicker sheds and the flicker minnows. Absolutely. You got to have some of those somewhere in, in your crate bake box. Um, Brad's thin fin. And finally, good old reef runners. Those will produce throughout the year. Um, and they just, they just work. They just work. I would absolutely recommend having some of those uh, in your inventory. So you're prepared. Next, let's talk about the Berkeley Flicker Shad Minnow a little bit more specifically here because you're going to want to look at the size seven and nines uh, for the Flicker Shad. And for the Flicker Minnows, I like the size 11, which is the longest and the biggest uh, size um, that they offer. And that's because those profiles just really are, um, are at, like kind of like really good sizes, imitations of the size of the bait that's in the water. Um, and those profiles, they just really, really connect really well. So remember the flicker shed size seven and nine, and then the flicker minnow size 11, um, or, and even the, the minnow, the flicker minnow size nine works as well. So I would say flicker shed seven and nine flicker minnow nine and 11, I believe, um, are the two sizes there that, that will, um, do you well out on Lake Michigan also, and I guess this is kind of like a little little bit of a putting you on to a little secret sauce here. But um, recently, uh, Berkeley came out with a flicker jointed shad. And these are smaller sizes. I want to say they're like size six. They're not they're not very big. But I found out this past year and absolutely destroyed the coho with them. They like this jointed smaller flicker uh, shad. It works extremely well. Fire Tiger, I just gave you like the cheat codes, guys. I just gave you the cheat codes. And if, if you really appreciate the cheat code, give this podcast episode a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Tell a friend to tell a friend. It helps uh, helps me out a lot. But the smaller jointed Fire Tiger uh, flicker sheds in the spring, oh, my God. And even in the summer when I was fishing in um, uh, for Skamania in the Indiana portion of Lake Michigan, they slammed it. They like that thing. It doesn't go too deep, which works out very well because uh, in, in in these times of year, the coho and skimania are not very deep. They're kind of higher in the water column, and it's just right in front of their face, and it was a really, really good time. Speaking of uh, crankbaits that don't go very deep in the water, uh, Brad's Thin Fin. It's an excellent lure for when the fish are high up in the water column as well, or if you're going to be casting in the harbors where – um, there's like submerged grass that, you know, maybe say you're in eight feet, but the grass comes up to like about, uh, you know, uh, it comes four feet off of the bottom. So you have like four feet of water, uh, available for you to fish before, you know, you get into the weeds. These thin fins are perfect for getting down and just a few feet under the water. Um, I tend to use these a lot in the kind of like early winter time when the Browns come into the harbors and they're kind of just swimming all around, uh, the submerged grass just on top of them. Um, or above them rather and just casting these thing in, them in or casting them out reeling them in just above the weeds uh, trout will smash them up um, you control them out in the open water as well uh, you're going to be getting a, a coho that are higher up in the water column a lot of times will come up and smack them um, so they work really effectively so you know if you don't have a bread's thin fin definitely check those out they work really well um, or i'll talk more about the color schemes for those but um, they are good and finally Reef runners. Uh, I know most people are already familiar with reef runners, uh, but these things really piss off big kings for whatever reason. I'm pretty sure it's the more violent wobble that it has. It just has a bigger profile. It's a bigger wobble. I mean, you can feel it when you're trolling it. You can feel the wobble and you can see it in your rod. It just thumps because of that wobble on the uh, the big reef runners here. Um, specifically, you, you want to look at the classic you know, reef runner size, um, the deep little ripper, and Ladies and gentlemen, my new top secret lure, I don't even know if it's going to be top secret because I'm about to tell you guys that are here listening to the podcast, the Reef Runner 44 Mag is absolutely insane. These things killed it this fall. 
Um, what a big surprise lure. Uh, I tell you what, I uh, had stopped by Rob at Lake Michigan Angler, and I was looking through some stuff. I'm like, hey, Rob, yeah, just kind of look for some things here and there. And uh, I, I, I can't recall if he pointed it out to me, or maybe I just saw it, and it caught my eye. And I think I recall asking him or saying to him, hey, have you tried this out? He goes, no, these are fairly new, they, you know, fairly new from Reef Runner. I was like, man, I think these would work well. He goes, yeah, sure. You know, he's kind of just like, yeah, okay, yeah. So I was like, all right, you know what? Let me grab a couple of these. Oh, my God. Probably the best money I spent. I mean, the uh, the returns of that investment were, were it's crazy. So check out the 44 mag from Reef Runner. Uh, I don't have any interest in Reef Runner. I'm not uh, endorsed by them or anything like that. So I'm giving you just, you know, straight up opinion and, and honest to God feedback. It, what a surprise bait. They demolished this thing. Fire Tiger and Hot Fire Tiger are the, the colors for that thing. Absolutely. All right. Speaking of colors, let's move on now. We talked about kind of like the three brand types and styles because each one of those three I mentioned, the Flicker Shad, the Flicker Minnow, the Thin Fin, and the Reef Runners all have different profiles, distinctly different profiles, uh, different ways, they like different vibrations, different uh, looks and how they you know work in the water. They're three very distinct distinctly different, which is why I think those are the three that if, if you only could put three in your boat and your kayak, rather those three cover everything wide, hard wobble, tight, fast wobble, shallow, like they cover a great amount of diversity. Um, so they'll, they'll fare you really well. Now let's talk about colors here because, um, despite what people think when they think of lures and they think oh, I got to get the right colors, honestly, the profiles of the bait are more important than the colors. I've, I'm telling you, I don't know that I have scientific data to prove this. I don't know if there's any been, if there's any research to, to back my statement here. This is just one of those things that from from being out in the water for years doing this, it's just you 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 recognize these these um you recognize these things, right? I can't tell you how many times I've been out in the water. Um, some even with some of you that are listening to this, possibly, um, but we'll be fishing and. You know, a buddy will hook up um, constantly with a fish. I'm like, damn. I was like, what you, I'm like, what are you using? Oh, I'm using, you know, uh, uh, pink lemonade. I'm using a pink lemonade color. All right, cool. I go and I get one of my pink lemonades. You know, maybe it's a reef runner. Maybe it's a flicker minnow. I get nothing. I get nothing. And I'm like, well, hey, pink lemonade, what? What lure are you using? Oh, I'm using a pink lemonade in, in um, you know, a uh, uh, size nine flicker shad. Oh, I might not have the size nine flicker shad, but clearly, even though I have the flicker minnow or even the reef runner in pink lemonade trolling, I'm putting it back the same amount of feet they're at. We're trolling in the same vicinity. Why am I not getting anything? It, it could simply be, and I believe it to be that they're keyed in on a certain profile. This kind of goes back to covering the three different types of crankbaits I mentioned prior, where the profile of the bait is, is more important. But that being said, we do need to move on into colors because colors do play a factor. They could be keyed in onto certain things visually as well. For me, some of the top colors that you should absolutely have here are going to be Fire Tiger. It's a great year-round color. Even when Lake Michigan has that perfectly clear water, you know, great conditions and all that, it's looking great. Fire Tiger still produces. I think a lot of times people think of Fire Tiger and they're thinking, oh, I got to use this when the water is kind of dingy or off colored and all that. And yeah, absolutely. You, you do want to use this in those conditions as well in Lake Michigan, usually you know, after some rains or um, sometimes you're fishing uh, parts of the lake where you have, um, you know, coming in and out of a harbor. Or if there's like a creek that comes in, you'll get that the mixture of the lake water with like the river water or just the wash from the marina and all that stuff. And it, you'll see like a mud line out in that water, which is a great place to troll in and out of, by the way. Uh, but whether it's clear, clear water or dingy, dirty water, um, you know, the fire tiger works. It's not like other types of fishing, like bass fishing, where you want to change those up. The fire tiger works all year round. Uh, pink lemonade is another great color. Wonder bread is a go-to color. Uh, blue head wonder bread, which is the, the, the wonder bread with, has a blue head, right? Obviously. Um, lime green with white is a really good color. Um, a red head with a white and a chartreuse zebra is what they call it. Um, now, different brands will have different names, but these are generally some of the colors you want to be looking for. And 
I know I'm not able to show you this visually, but if you were to look some of these names up, you know, you know, crankbait, fire tiger, or pink lemonade, you should be able to pop up some pictures to kind of give you a visual idea of what you're looking for here. Um, those are just a handful of the lure colors that, that, that I keep that I will go to throughout the year and they produce and they work. Um, you can try other things as well. Pinks work really well. Reds, golds. Um, I don't use personally a lot of, of like, um, like the silver reflective um, stuff. I, I tend to use painted colors, bright colors, and and those work really well. Um, again, guys do use, you know, like like uh, the metallic uh, silver reflective stuff, and it'll it'll catch and it'll work as well. Um, it's just something that I don't. I just have more confidence in the colored stuff. It's just bright and, and colorful and annoying looking. Um, color selection overall can just be very overwhelming because there's just so many options and you know every brand has their own colors they name it differently just take a look at what's out there and take in consideration some of the colors that i mentioned and you should be just fine a lot of this can be trial and error it's all about getting confidence in the lure itself and and what makes it more difficult is that throughout the year certain brands um and, and places will get custom colors uh, which you can purchase as well, which I have done, and uh, they work too. So there's options out there for you to check out, but you can also kind of keep it simple to the colors that I have mentioned as well. Next, let's talk about flies. Um, not the ones that are going to be all over your face on the days you're out on Lake Michigan with no wind because those things are brutal. I'm talking about the flies that you put behind a dodger or a flasher to troll to catch fish. Um, flies are just very effective way to catch your fish year round for the most part. Uh, now, the fly itself doesn't do anything in the water alone. It, it, it doesn't. It's just a treble hook covered by a skirt, some beads, and a knot, and that's it. It doesn't do anything. You need a flasher or a dodger to impart the action to the fly. Um, now, there's many com companies and brands that make flies. Honestly, you know, I don't have a preference. I just, you know, I just look for the colors and I, I, I can't recommend a specific brand. There's just so many out there. In fact, you can do these yourself. They're not incredibly difficult to make uh, yourself. So what I will share with you are the colors that, that I really feel are best uh, to, to have and to look for, or even if you're going to do this yourself, DIY it and make them. Um, you want flies that have blues, greens, oranges, you want uh, reflective white and like silver, like for the flash effect and gold. Um, those are the colors that you're going to want in a fly, right? Um, not saying all of them in one fly, but I'm just saying, you know, maybe a blue with an orange or a green with a gold or a blue and a green. Blue and green actually is, is one of the, the blue, green, gold is one of the best. Blue, green, white, silver is, is, is a top producer for me as well. Um, but those colors, look at the flies out there. You know, look for ones that have those within the, you know, the color of the fly and you should be good to go. There's also two types of flies. Um, you have the peanut fly. These flies are a little bit shorter. There may be like the skirt itself. The fly, the skirt itself is, the skirt itself is shorter, maybe about two, two and a half, maybe three inches at most long. Um, these are fairly smaller. And then you have like the regular size, which uh, they have a name for them. I forgot what it's called off the top of my head, but these are usually like five, maybe six inch long skirts. And you, usually these are being used to target kings in the summer. Um, and so there's two different types. I generally run the peanut flies uh, just because I tend to, uh, it, I feel like it, it works really well year round for a variety of fish. Coho, it'll catch kings, it'll catch lakers. Um, and browns so i just kind of go with the peanut fly although i do have the bigger ones as well one trick that i do with my flies though i do want to share this with you a um, little bit of a more advanced thing here but uh if you look at a fly the skirt is threaded through the line and there's beads that are placed um right after the hook over the knot to prevent the skirt from going over the hook and you know falling back over the the treble hook. In fact, when you when you have your fly, um, you're gonna want to pull it down all the way to where you know where the as far as down as it goes, where the beads prevent it from um, going any further. And uh, you want to have it so that the end of the fly, right, the end of the material, is just over the treble hook. If the skirt extends way past it, you can have a situation where the fish comes up to nip the 
back of that skirt, but um, the hook, the treble hook is is not sticking far back enough where it'll hook itself. So I always trim my skirts so that the treble hook is is just lined up with the back of the skirt. And the simple way to do this is just hold the fly, you know, grab the, the top of the loop, hang it, you know, so it's hanging, uh, it's hanging down. And you can see how the, the skirt sits on the hook. If you see that the skirt is is sticking out way past the hook, trim it down a little bit so that if a fish does come for the very tail end of that fly, um, there's a greater chance for it to um, go ahead and uh, suck in that hook with it. Um, if the if the um, skirt is too long, you'll, you you could run in situations. If you're not hooking up with a fish, begin hits drive bys as we call them. It could be because that uh, the tail end of the uh, fly is just a little too long. It's not catching the hook when it when it goes to uh, swipe at the uh, fly. All right, perfect transition transition here to dodgers and flashers, which is what you will need in order to use a fly uh, for for your trolling here. Now, these can be, it can be a lot to take in when you go into a shop or you look online at dodgers and there's so many different types, kinds, colors, sizes. It's, 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 I know when I first got into this, I'm like, oh my God, where do I even start? What do I even pick here? So you can keep it simple right here. Uh, when it comes to Dodgers, I would recommend the Lure Jensen double O size, which is the six inch smaller Dodgers. Um, you're gonna wanna look at reds, you're gonna wanna look at oranges, uh, and you're gonna wanna look at, uh, it's, a, it's a yellow with red dots on it. Uh, I've heard it referred to as clown color. Um, people call it a different color. I don't remember, remember off the top of my head. Uh, those three are like good for year round. Um, will do you really well. You can go and get other colors, but you know, a solid red, a, um, orange, solid orange, and then the yellow with the red dots on it are like money. Um, you can really keep it as simple as that. Um, and the reason for the double O size is because they're smaller. It's just less, uh, resistance in the water, which translates into you not having to, you know, output as a uh, more, effort in your paddling and pedaling to you know uh, tr uh troll in the water because that is going to be added resistance as you put your lines out uh you have this metal plate in the water you know tumbling around and all of that so the smaller size gets the job done and it's just really really good for using out of a kayak now when it comes to flashers uh we're not so lucky man um these flashers are going to be 11 inches and they're they're bigger pieces and you're going to feel it when you're trolling it. You'll absolutely feel that resistance and you'll feel it, you know, as you're paddling or pedaling, you'll feel, you'll just feel it. That's all, all I can really explain here. There's no workaround on this, uh, but I do like the Dreamweaver um, flashers here. The paddle flasher 11 inch um, works really well and the spin doctor flasher as well. Um, really good. And with the spin doctor, definitely recommend the orange one. Springtime with the coho does exceptionally well with uh, putting a fly behind it. Does exceptionally well when it comes to the standard paddle flashers. Uh, you can go with you can go with ones that um, um, have, all have UV on it, like a UV strip or high, you know UV coated or whatever the case may be. You, you definitely want that uh, with the tape on it. Uh, 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 ones with green, ones that have green, um, some red, some black, some silver. Uh, tend to do really well. I would recommend looking at uh, flashers that have some some of those colors on it or those kind of tapes on it. Um, and again, as I said, the Spin Doctor, that that orange, the solid orange in the springtime is definitely, definitely money. Now, spoons, there's a lot to talk about with spoons because again, similar to the flashers and Dodgers, there's, there's just so many options out there. So many different ma uh, brands make them. Uh, so many different sizes and all of this here. Um, you have two types of spoons generally here. You have the mag spoons, which are the bigger ones. And then the stinger spoons are generally the little slimmer ones. And I like the, the stingers over the mags just because of the profile. The stinger tend to produce better for me uh, with a variety of species throughout more of the year. Um, I generally drop the mag spoons summertime when we're out deeper water trying to get one of those bigger bites from a king that might be out there. Uh, you know, the whole bigger bait, bigger fish kind of idea. Uh, some spoons are you know flat finish others are hammered have like the hammered nickel kind of look to it um and uh so i haven't really noticed the difference in either one of them so you could pick whatever you like and i did already do a video covering my top five spoon colors and and all of that so 
I'm going to go ahead and just link to that video in the description below to save us some time on this podcast because I already covered it and you can actually see the spoons and the colors that I'm talking about. So I'll refer or defer rather to that at this point. Uh, finally, uh, another setup that's commonly used on Lake Michigan, although not much by kayak guys because there's a little bit more work involved, um, meat rigs uh, as well as the spinning globe. But in terms of meat rigs, they're very popular. A lot of boat guys use them. Now, I haven't personally used a meat rig. Um, you know, with a meat rig, it requires uh, herring strips or some type of, you know, uh, bait in there. And a lot of meat rigs require um, some work to set it all up. Although the Musclehead brand has become very popular uh, on uh, with the guys on Lake Michigan because it's a, a bit of an easier way to do your meat rigs. I haven't used it myself. This is just me seeing what people are saying on the forums and the fishing groups on Facebook that swear by this thing. So I thought it was worth mentioning that that it's an option out there if you wanted to do it. Um, obviously, if it's less work to set up a meat rig um, with their brand, maybe it's something you want to try on your kayak. I personally don't want to deal with bait and uh, fish strips of any kind and doing all that stuff. Um, and I'm still catching fish without it. I tend to see guys really utilizing meat rigs in the summertime when they're out couple hundred feet of water you know uh, when the fish are way out deep uh, that's where i tend to see most of the times it uh, being used and in, in producing uh, as far as spinning glows they're also pretty effective especially for lakers and browns when you're fishing for them off the bottom of the water it's they're not a species that i, I typically target when i'm in the open water fishing um you know for salmon like coho and kings so if i do catch them they're kind of like a bonus fish you know uh, but if you wanted to actually target them, spinning goals are actually a great, um, you know, setup to use uh, to drop your your your, your uh, presentation down towards the bottom, just a foot or two off the bottom, um, or something like that, and uh, you'll get bit up pretty good. Now let's go ahead and tie this whole thing off. It's been a while here, and I appreciate you guys for for bearing with me. It's a lot a lot of information here. Uh, but I guess that's what a podcast is all about, right? You can digest this at your own pace, come back to it when you need to. Uh, we're going to cap everything off here with accessories and uh, things that are kind of needed in order to make some of these presentations work. Uh, one of the most critical things you will need is weights to get your uh, presentation down in deep water. And in my opinion, the best way to go about this is a torpedo weight. The reason for this is because it's a very kind of um, well-designed, when you think of a torpedo and how a torpedo is designed to cut through the water, um, that's exactly what this weight is, is designed to look like and, and, and operate like in the water. It cuts through the water. So even when you have heavier, very heavy uh, weights on there, um, it's cutting through that water. So it's less resistance as you're paddling and pedaling with it. It can get down deep, and it's super effective for trolling in a kayak. It requires you to clip on the weight to your line. And there's a few ways to do that. It's hard to explain in this podcast. So if you would like me to do a video on this, again, reminding you, let me know in the comments below and I can work on that, on how to do a complete torpedo weight setup on your line. And uh, I actually picked up a new, I guess for lack of a better word, device that allows me to attach the weight to my line where when a fish does strike, it'll I don't have to manually take off the weight anymore. It'll stay on my line. So I'm really, really excited to use this um, this season. And once I do put it through its paces, I'm, I will uh, be doing a review and sharing with you more on that. But right now, when I just got it and, it, and it's, you know, I haven't proven it just yet. I want to wait and hold off before I share what it is so I can kind of just see how it works, first of all. Now, with torpedo weights, there's really two sizes that you're going to need. They're not cheap either and you do not want to lose these um thankfully though because we're fishing in deeper water I i've never lost one in the water because you're fishing in open water unless you come up on shallow ground and you're not paying attention which is how you can lose it um, but if you're paying attention to your fish finder and you know that you're you've got the weight um you know not as deep or you know not as deep as the water you're fishing in you should be good to go but an eight ounce for sure is one that you will need and i use the eight ounce when i'm fishing in the 50 feet or less the eight ounce works great um then there's the 12 ounce the big boy um now i use this anytime we're 50 feet or deeper and we're you know we're out there fishing and i'm trying to get this lure this setup down 50 feet plus uh we're going to be using the 12 ounce 
because it's going to get that down there quickly and it's going to it's going to keep it down there. So when you're trolling, um, it's going to keep it in that zone that you're trying to let the line out. Because remember how it works when, when, when there's like this um, um, there's like this effect in the water. There's a term for it. And I don't remember exactly what it's called. But when you start trolling forward, you know, if you set your lines down 40 feet, when you start moving forward, your lines are actually going to come up higher than where you set them just because with the movement and all that stuff, it's just naturally going to rise. So a heavier weight will, will, will do better at keeping it down at the depth that you want it to stay at. Uh, so those are the two weights that you, that, that you absolutely are just going to need to get. There's no, there's no really going around that. And uh, finally, let's talk about planer boards as we wrap this episode up here. Planer boards are a great option to get your lines out and cover more water. You can put them out. You can uh, have a spread out a little bit further off to your sides. You can cover more water that way. And in a kayak, you're going to want the smaller size ones uh, for the least amount of resistance. Um, the pros here with planer boards is that Again, you can spread your lines out. You can cover more water. So it makes it easier for you to run multiple lines uh, off your kayak. If you, want to, if you want to run three lines, if you want to run once your left about 20, 30 feet, one off to your right 20, 30 feet, and then you run your lead course straight off your back, all those lines are sp spread out now. So if you do get, let's say, a strike on your lead core, um, you can still keep going or, or, or moving forward, and it's less likely that, that fish will run into those lines hopefully fingers crossed because these fish tend to always do that regardless. Um, but the idea here is that your lines are spread out. So you're covering more water, to, you know, obviously that's important to, to get out, get on top of fish. Um, but it also helps that when you do hook up with something that um, it's less likely the fish will run into some of your other lines and you can fight them off and um, do it that way. Uh, one of the big cons with the current offerings of planer boards on the market though, is that at a certain point when you reel up the line, um, you're going to have to stop to take off that planer board off your, your line, off your main line, uh, dump it in your kayak, and then let go of the line and then continue fighting that fish. You know, when you're on a boat, you can have someone do that for you. But remember, when you're in a kayak, you have to do all of this yourself, maintain your, you know, your momentum going forward, watch out for any boats in the area, still have to try and keep track of the fish. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot to balance and, and, and juggle. And I'm not necessarily a fan of that. I like to keep things as simple as possible out in the water, uh, especially when I'm hooking up with a fish. I don't want to have something else to worry about. That is a potential way for me to, to, to throw the fish off the line. Um, so that's a big con for me and a reason why I haven't used a planer board on my setups just yet. However, just like I mentioned, I picked up a new device to, to rig up my uh, torpedo weights. I did pick up this this um, planer board. It's new to me. It's been on the market apparently for, for a little while now, but I don't think it's made enough of a splash in the marketplace that everyone, people are, are really aware about it. So um, I'm excited to try it out this season because it's essentially uh, will stay on the main line. Even after you hook up, it'll stay on the main line. And uh, this is also important why you have the uh, the line, why I tie my lines with a small bear bearing swivel, ball bearing swivel with a bead on it. Uh, the idea is that this this uh, planer board will um, pop off when, when a fish hits and just slide down to that uh, bead and barrel swivel and it'll stay there. And I don't have to manually take it off of my line. I can just fight the fish and it just stays on the line and it stays out of the way. So I am excited about trying out this planer board this season. And, you know, once I put it through its paces and I feel like I have a good grasp on it, you can uh, definitely expect a review coming to the channel on it. And it might be something that you guys are going to be interested in because I think potentially um, this is this is another great effective piece for us on the kayak. In fact, I, I have a buddy that uh, guides on Lake Erie um, and he uses them and, and he's the one that, you know, told me about it and swore by them and said, hey, it'd be great for you on Lake Michigan because you, you're you basically doing the same fishing that, that I'm doing in Erie, he said. And to, to a certain extent, we, you know, we are. We're trolling on, you know, Big Great Lake. And and uh, although he's trolling for a walleye, uh, the idea is we're doing the same thing, right? Big open waters, we're trolling. You don't have to deal with all this stuff. And um, so I hope to report uh, good news on that in the near future. And I think with that, we've covered a quite a bit of, of stuff here. Again, these are all the essentials, you know, you can go on in this topic forever. We all love fishing and gear. Oh God. Uh, so I'm sure this could be an endless conversation, but I wanted to share with you, like, these are the essentials. These are the things that, 
you have to have in your your setups in your inventory um for you to have some successful days out there uh at minimum at minimum all right so we'll wrap up the podcast here uh i'll give you guys a heads up episode four We'll be talking about safety on Lake Michigan, which is very important. It's an area that doesn't get enough attention. Uh, obviously, with the spring coming up and people getting back on the water, uh, safety is going to be paramount because water temps are going to be in the you know mid 30s, 40s, up into the 50s. Air temps are going to be 40s or so, and it's still a recipe for disaster. So, episode four of the Lake Michigan Kayak Fishing Podcast will be dedicated to safety, and I look forward to talking to you there. If you enjoyed yourself on the podcast, please subscribe to the channel, throw it a like, share it with a friend. It helps out a lot. And if there's any questions about anything we discussed here, please leave it in the comments below. I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you.